Emotional Blur. It's a new novel about an epic road trip with an emotional impact. Don't go anywhere. We're getting into it here at Book Circle Online. This is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Book Circle Online. We are here today, and uh, I'm excited. We are going to be delving into a new book, Emotional Blur, by author Robert Erringer. Before we do that, I just want to remind you that you can reach me, Katerina Kazayas, here at Book Circle Online anytime. You can also catch up with me via my social media, at Katerina Kazayas on both Twitter and Instagram. I make it easy for you to find me. Uh, but we're going to make it easy for you to find author Robert Erringer today as well. Robert, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Katerina. It's great to have you here. It's nice to be here. Uh, we were talking uh, just before this episode started about our love of books, our mutual love of real, physical, hard copy books. So we know that you at home are also you know, fans of books, and so we're happy to be here. Robert, what I'd like for you to do before we get into too much is, I'm going to bump it into your court. Would you give our audience just a brief synopsis of the premise of the book without, of course, giving away too much of it? Sure. Well, it is a road trip novel, as you know, and uh, it has a lot of, it, it's a very structured story about a disaffected surfer dude who lives in the Santa Barbara area. And uh, he works karaoke at a bar, and he also drives for a, a taxi service, mm -hmm. kind of a private taxi service. And uh, he's called upon to take a journey, or that is, take a passenger to Las Vegas. As a, so he's the driver. He's the driver, right. uh, and it's it's written in first-person protagonist, so he's mm -hmm. telling the story. And he fights the assignment because the next day is his birthday, and he would rather just hang out and surf and guzzle beer uh, than drive anywhere, uh, least of all Las Vegas, which, uh, as you know, is about five and a half hour drive from Santa Barbara, where the action begins. So he uh, he's basically told it's him or, or no one, and in fact, this passenger has specifically asked for him, although he has no idea why. And, uh, um, and he knows he will lose his vehicle, and he doesn't have a car of his own if he doesn't go along with the assignment. So guess so what? You have to work, buddy. He has yeah. to work. <laughs> and uh, early next morning, he picks up his uh, passenger, who's an elderly gentleman from the Biltmore Hotel mm -hmm. in Montecito. And, uh, and the journey begins. And, um, and he's hoping, of course, to do a quick turnaround in Las Vegas, five and a half hours there, five and a half hours back, get back to Summerland in time for beer and, and, and buffalo wings sure. at, uh, at the Nugget. <laughs> but when he arrives in Vegas, or rather he's, he's looking for what exit his passenger wants, the passenger says, well, I don't think I want to go here. Keep going. And uh, and the driver says, "Well, we're we're running out of we're running out of Vegas, um, and if you don't make a decision soon, we're going to end up in Utah." And the passenger says, "Fine, let's go to Utah." Well, this now spoils uh, the the driver's plans uh, even worse than before, and he's a bit discombobulated by the whole thing, and uh, takes a break and calls back to the office as to what he should do, and they tell him that well, their passenger is already prepaid to keep going. So he's got no choice but to keep going. <laughs> Poor guy. And, uh, and the journey continues. And the journey continues into seven more states. Uh, it winds through, makes yeah. makes it fun. The first night is mm -hmm. in Park City, Utah, after a 12-hour drive. <laughs> and uh, next day winds through, um, winds up to Wyoming mm -hmm. for a second night in, in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, and then ventures all the way up to Montana, mm -hmm. uh, big sky country. Uh, before turning around, heading back uh, back south, southwest again. Into California. I had a question as I was reading this, and I wanted to know if you yourself had done that kind of a road trip through those particular states. Absolutely. It's, it's my new methodology for writing uh, road trip novellas like this. I've written a few since, but this is the very first one. I'd spent a few months uh, mapping out the story that I had in mind hmm. before I took the actual trip, and I did take so the same route. So you took the, the actual trip. That, Absolutely. Uh, fantastic. Not only did I take the, the trip because I wanted to have the setting just right, hmm. uh, but I also took with me a friend who I loosely modeled the, uh, the driver character after. Ah. So I wanted to see his reaction to certain things and be able... So it's, it's a marriage of of real setting, mm -hmm. a genuine road trip with a fictional story. And, and you know, it was a fictional story, but at the same time, uh, what I felt you really did well was give the characters some depth. So for the protagonist, his name is Luke Anderson, he's the surfer guy, I 
felt him. I, I got you got to really understand that he was that kind of sort of laissez-faire type of hey dude, life is cool. Um, and with the passenger in the back seat, um, he was very much uh, you know a little a little more um, I'd say a classic gentleman. Uh, a little, a little more uh, true to character for you know a 60, 65 year old man that had jumped in the back seat that had demanded a driver. So you did a nice uh, unfolding of those characters for me. I got to to really see them in my mind's eye. Thank you. I I knew these characters so well mm. because as I just mentioned, I had one sure. of them actually on the road trip <laughs> with me, and then the other, the elderly gentleman. Mm. It, none of, neither of these characters are me. Okay. Um, and the elderly gentleman is the man who was my mentor earlier in my existence when I was doing other th- things. Things besides oh. writing so I styled it after his character mm-hmm. and so that I had a lot of good material to work from for that had he uh, been there during your formative years uh, I would say as, well as a mentor or as a just a role model I, I would say as a mentor professionally somebody okay. I knew when I was well into my 30s into my 40s when I was living in Washington DC right. doing spooky stuff but um, okay. um, <laughs> I enjoyed this book for a couple of reasons. Um, first and foremost, because I had done a road trip myself last year. Mm-hmm. So I traveled from um, from Florida to California. I did a cross trip, oh, cool. cross country. I took the um, the highway, um, the, the I-10 all the way across. And, and same thing, we drove through Mississippi and New Mexico and Texas and, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, different states. And it's interesting to see how... Not only does the landscape change, but the people change, the towns change. Uh, Of the states that you modeled this book off of, which was your favorite? I enjoyed everywhere, but I I especially liked Wyoming. And I I was really surprised by Boise, Hmm. Boise, Idaho. I had no idea what to expect. I'd never been there before Hmm. and actually found a very vibrant, sophisticated city. You were a complimentary of Boise in the book, too, yeah. Lots, because that's how I truly felt. Mm -hmm. Um, Interesting you mentioned the cross-country. Originally, I planned this novel to be based on a cross-country road trip. Only the day before departure did I change my mind. Um, And the reason for that was I felt that the cross-country trip is something of a cliché. And I did not want what I think is an original piece of fiction Mm -hmm. to be burdened with a cliché. And Mm -hmm. I felt that it deserved a whole different rooting of its own which is why I changed direction and decided to go up to Montana instead. And I think it worked much better for the story uh, that I ultimately told. And who knows what I was exactly going to write until I took the trip. Well, and, and that's part of what I enjoyed, too, is because, you you know, it, it, as you started sharing with the audience here today, as you said, you know, they were heading towards Vegas, and then the guy in the back just changed his mind and said, hey, let's keep going. And they get to Utah, and he goes, hey, let's keep going. And they, from there, they go into Wyoming. And so they just kept traveling together, much to the chagrin of, uh, you know, of our driver. With a reluctant uh, driver right. who just wants to go home. Right. He just wants to go surf. But, right. um, but what I liked about it was the fact that I didn't, as a reader, I didn't know where we were headed. And so it was a it was a twist and a turn. I've never been through these states. I mean, I've been to Vegas, uh, but I have never been further east, you know, kind of mid country. Nor have I been up to Montana or Idaho. Uh, so it was it was fun as a um, as a reader to just sort of travel along, which is the whole point of books. Right? And I, I wrote it in a style that's, as you know, rather uh, character driven, dialogue driven. Sure. Um, so that you, uh, the reader actually feels they're there in the car right. with the two characters. Well, I felt and, that absolutely. And you felt the motion. Mm-hmm. Uh, emotional blur. Tell me about the title. I had it in my mind for a long time, and I had no idea what I was going to do with it until this particular story came to me, and then I decided that would be the ideal title uh, because of the play on words. Of course, the motion of being in a vehicle and the blurriness that you, the road provides as you're traveling 80 miles an hour, but also, uh, as the reader will discover, there is some emotion in the story as well. Absolutely. Um, What prompted you to want to write a road trip novel in the first place? I've always wanted to write a road trip novel. But what actually happened was I got talked into by my family into joining uh, or trying to join a private country club where we live. Okay. And um, and I, I've been member a member of private clubs before that I hardly use, so I wasn't so enamored by the idea of it. But I was going to try to please them, until the club membership, or rather the membership uh, uh, committee, had an issue with the fact that I had been, I was, I am a writer mm-hmm. and had been a journalist, and they were a little concerned about privacy issues. <laughs> so they singled me out for a confidentiality agreement. 
And, oh, wow. And I actually had no problem with it, um, uh, except when I received it, because I thought it would be a standard confidentiality agreement, but it turned out to be something that was that was ridiculously uh, punitive in nature, hmm. to a point where if I had someone told me a joke in the club, and I told that joke to somebody else outside the club, I would be fined $25,000. So uh, once I saw how it was written, I showed it to my lawyer, and we both just laughed. I said, "Well, thank you very much, but I think I will, I'll, I'll, I'll keep my money and my First Amendment rights." Right. Maybe I'll go hang out at the public club down the street. Wow. Well, you know, I got I got plenty of watering holes to go to where I live in Montecito and in mm. Santa Barbara, so I, mm -hmm. I don't really have much use for a private club. Plus, so what I thought was, I took my money back. And I bought a vehicle just for taking road trips with the idea of instead of um, hiding myself in exclusion, which is what private club members tend to do, is I would actually open my spirit to the road and meet lots of new people and have lots of new learning experiences. And, and you did just that. I have been doing just that, first with that road trip on which this novella is based, but I've been doing it ever since for the last two years. Well, you um, have you have you taken a road trip to anywhere else oh. aside from... Yes. Oh, I've taken a number of them. I'm still working up to that cross-country road trip, okay. which, I, which may even be this December. I might just put a bunch of books in the back of my vehicle and, and, just go. and hit bookstores right across the country. And, and just do signings and visits and the whole thing? At least I now got a, a rationale for driving all the way across the country. Do you have an end point in mind for the cross-country trip? Maybe Route um, 66? or It being, it, it, it getting closer to winter when I would do this, um, um, I would... Uh, I, go the southern flank right. and go through Texas, New Orleans, mm -hmm. and make it to Florida, and then maybe go up the east coast. Sure. But I have done Route 66 on other trips. I drove to the Grand Canyon okay. and Sedona yeah. and, and did that whole experience. It was very cool. You know what I like about road trips and what I found uh, enjoyable about mine? I had never really taken a long road trip before uh, a year ago when I, uh, when I drove, as I said, across the country. But what I enjoyed was the freedom to stop wherever you felt like stopping for as long as you felt like stopping. Um, the ride in my case was it could have been done in five days and i ended up uh, bringing a friend of mine down she and i took 12 days to do it because we did just that we stopped in new orleans for three days and then we stopped in scottsdale and phoenix for a couple of days and you know in texas for a few days and, and just got to actually enjoy being in those cities and not just driving straight through Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the, the road is a metaphor for freedom, mm. and you don't want to be burdened with uh, reservations anywhere. And one, of, one of the rules, and I try to avoid club rules, that's what I was running away from, but um, I, I have a tongue-in-cheek rule in the road trips I take that there's never a hotel reservation. Mm. That we, you get there, you see what there is, you like it, you don't like it, maybe you keep moving, maybe you stay, but you're not burdened by I lose my money if I don't stay at a place I book. Right, and and I and I think that's a you know that's tricky for a lot of people because most people need structure. They want to know where they're going. So I think it's it's a little liberating to ha be of the philosophy that you can just kind of let go and and uh, and live. On that note, I have um, a quote in the book for those of you that uh, that may want to get a copy. You're going to want to read the quote on page seventy, um, and it says, "Life's journey is not to arrive at the grave safely in a well-preserved body." but rather to slide in sideways, worn out and shiting. Holy shit, what a ride. <laughs> yeah, a, a genuine sign that was in that garage in Wyoming. Uh, Did you in, find in this sign? Absolutely. Oh, wow. Oh, what, what I try to do in writing these um, road trip novellas mm -hmm. is include as much as possible of what I've experienced along the road. Right. So that incidental experiences, people, bars, restaurants, uh, the, all the aromas, the flavors that I come across mm -hmm all go into the novel. Um, and that's why I say it's a marriage of that genuine setting with, uh, with, with a fictional story. Right. Now, you have um, written a number of books. I counted about 20, is that right? No, I don't think it's that many. Okay. Maybe, maybe a dozen. But, but, there, but there are a lot. And some of them are fiction, some of them are nonfiction. Is there a, um, a different mindset that you need to be in to write fiction versus non? I would assume so. Yeah, a different style as well. Hmm. Um, I might add, before I go into that, is this sure. is the first road novel I've written, and I do believe it is the best writing I've ever done. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. Yes. I really appreciate that. Uh -huh. uh, but my background um, originally is in journalism. Mm. So it was a natural extension of that to write uh, a couple of books, nonfiction books, one of which was um, about Lech Wałęsa and the Solidarity Movement in Poland way mm. back in 1980-81. And that was published in 1982 by Dodd Mead in New York. Sadly, it no longer exists. Mm. And then um, years later, after I dabbled in the world of uh, intelligence and espionage and had worked nine, ten years um, undercover for FBI counterintelligence, I wrote 
um, a nonfiction book about my exploits doing that kind of work hmm. in Moscow, Havana, and elsewhere. Wow. How do you how do you transition from how did you go from journalism into um, intelligent to operative type of work? Um, because uh, one of my interests in when I was doing journalism was national security, mm -hmm. intelligence, and espionage, and consequently I interviewed people in who worked in those professions, and I eventually evolved from journalism into literary agenting in the late 1980s around New York City. And I specialized in Washington insiders. So mm -hmm. again, that opened a door to the Washington insider world. I represented uh, William Colby, the former director of the CIA. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I was hoping that uh, the mentor that I spoke of, who just retired as the deputy of, uh, director of operations for the CIA, um, I was hoping that he would write a book. Hmm. And what I didn't know at the time was any kind of self-promotion was anathema to this man. And oh. he would never write, um, he would never write anything, let alone a kiss and tell. So, mm -hmm. um, but he had a grand idea. He said, well, you, since you're moving to Washington, as I was, I'm not going to write a book, but why don't we do something together since we seem to get along so well? And I said, well, what would that be? He said, well, let's be consultants in private sector intelligence. And, um, and I joked, yes, but only, only for billionaires and royalty. And we laughed. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. Uh, within six months, we were a private sector intelligence consultants working for billionaires and royalty. <laughs> and, and when you say royalty, we've got to explain that a little bit because um, I know a little bit about, about your background. Uh, you were commissioned by Prince Albert of Monaco to start the first Intelligence service in Monaco, the Monaco Intelligence Service. That is correct. Back in the uh, you know early nineties, was it? Mid no, no, that was in uh, that was or in early two thousand. Uh, two thousand two right. is when that happened. I'd known him before that because um, I'd, I lived in Monaco in okay. the late nineteen eighties, hmm. and I'd gotten to know him during that period. And then sure. while I was working undercover for the FBI during the nineteen nineties, yep. uh, we saw each other once in a while, largely because a lot of my work had Monaco connections to it. Okay, so. Um, after I stopped working for the FBI, which uh, I had to because my cover got blown at some point, yeah. um, but 9-11 happened and I was living in Santa Barbara and I thought, you know, I still want to be involved in doing something worthwhile mm -hmm. with the expertise that I, I had by then. So um, I went to see Prince Albert in Monaco and, uh, and he decided to retain me as his intelligence advisor. Mm -hmm. At the time, he was only the prince hereditaire, oh. which meant he was not running his country. His father was running his country. Sure. But he wanted to be very well informed about the things going on in his principality uh, so that when he did take power, as he did in April 2005, mm -hmm. he would know what to do and not be taken by surprise. Mm -hmm. They sort of kept him in the dark. Um, so I started with him in 2002, kept him extremely well informed about people who were trying to penetrate his social circle and about, um, about corrupt Russians sure. who were trying to escape Russia uh, with bloodied hands and, and hide their money and find residency in, in Monaco. Mm -hmm. So that when he did uh, become the Prince of Monaco in 2005, I then more formally created what became known as the Monaco Intelligence Service. Which, wow. I, which I directed myself. Right. Wow. That's that's a heck of a story. I've been to Monaco several times, and um, for those of you that may not have been, it, it really is crawling with Russians. <laughs> uh, um, Prince they're, Albert, they're, they're everywhere. Prince Albert did not listen. Mind you, one, oh. it's it's not that Russians are bad. And, no. And, no, 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 exactly. Uh, and but. when I when I first went there and I had access to all the police files, there were six, 62 Russian residents, and they were all perfectly nice people who had every right to gain residency. But what would soon happen, and we knew it was happening because it was happening uh, already along the Côte d'Azur in France, mm -hmm. was that people would start to fall out, Russians would start to fall out with Putin. Mm -hmm. People like Sergei Pugachev, who stole $800, $800 million from the bank that he had in, in Moscow, that Putin would eventually become aware of it. They'd be on the outs, and they needed safe haven somewhere. And so we expected those kinds of unsavory people to move into Monaco. And that's exactly what happened, mm -hmm. um, because ultimately, Prince Albert decided to take the path of least resistance and go with the 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 people he grew up with. I would call the people who were corrupting influences. Hmm. Well, you know, Monaco had um, a bit of a moniker there for a while, which was you know a sunny place for shady people. And I know he had an intention to clean that up. Do you feel as though um, Monaco has has managed to change their reputation a little bit? 
Um, I think they've tried, but mm -hmm. not at all. I think mm -hmm. what's happened is, as you pointed out, if you go there now, yeah. uh, the venues are in, are in Russian. Right. And yeah. nothing wrong with the Russians, except sure. the kind of Russians that Monaco and bank confidentiality uh, tends to attract. And there was a deline delineation for me and the foreign intelligence services with which I had liaison um, relationships was, do they kill anybody? Mm -hmm. do, they, do they come in with bloodied hands? I mm -hmm. mean, there are a lot of people who stole uh, I right. felt that the market sort of a white should be, collar versus a, yeah, yeah, it's but that's crossing a line that I felt we you really want to be careful not to allow certain Russians or certain people from anywhere into Monaco, give them residency, or even give them nationality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how is living in Europe different from living in uh, on the west coast of uh, the USA? Oh, what what a contrast! I mean, I, I've <laughs> probably is. lived a third of my life in London, okay. and I still consider it more home than anywhere. Hmm. So, and I miss it terribly. It's a fabulous city, London, especially the seasons. Um, but it's yeah, two two very different ways of, of life, um, and I, it, it it would take a whole book to to talk about exactly what. With um, with your varied background, as you said, you were a journalist, uh, an intelligence operative, a, now a, you know, and a novelist. When did you write your first book? How long have you been a writer? Uh, well, I started in the late 1970s as a journalist, and I wrote a first book, which I call a booklet, called The Global Manipulators. Ah. And it was the very first book ever published on the Bilderberg Group, which nobody had ever heard of back then. Now it's a little better known, but this is the group that some people who might be called conspiracy theorists believe uh, they get together secretly behind closed doors and control world events mm -hmm. and the world's finances. Puppeteers, right. And back then there was no internet and, and it, was, it took a lot of painstaking research to actually figure out that the Bilderberg Group truly existed. And so, did, were you part of the team that helped prove that? Uh, well, I, I wrote my book, and it was published in the UK, and I still think it was subject to a conspiracy because it was mm -hmm. it was made with such cheap pace that if you opened it more than five times, the pages started to fall out. <laughs> with um, with your background, I had also read that your uh, that your father was an artist. He had, was a Disney illustrator. Is that right? Actually, absolutely. He worked out here. I remember as a little kid, he used to bring me out, me and my brother, to Disney Studios. Uh, where he did animation work, Very cool. coloring books, things like that, mm -hmm. and then in time evolved into a fine artist, mm -hmm. uh, which is how he ha happily spent the last uh, 20, 30 years of his life, is painting and sculpting. Did you take that creative gene at all, or did yours um, I, stay on the writer's path? Uh, writing alone. Okay. My father liked to write too, but I could not I could not paint worth a damn. I, could, <laughs> I can't even draw, so no, none of that filtered through to me, right. just, just the writing part. Would you, um, would you, in contrast to your mentor, be interested in writing a memoir uh, of your life at some point? I, I did. I mm -hmm. wrote an earlier book that I called The Spy Master and Me, okay. and it was largely about, all about, my relationship with my mentor, former business partner, mm -hmm. um, uh, who'd, who'd wrote, risen to a very high up job at the CIA. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't about the CIA, it was about the, the fun assignments we worked on together flying Concord to Europe, um, I probably was Amazing. on Concord ten times, uh, the two of us flying back and forth and staying at all the most wonderful hotels in mm -hmm. Geneva, Zurich, uh, London, Paris. It, it, was a, it was a great, great period of time. Sounds great to me. You have another quote in the book here, which, um, which again resonated a little bit with me. Uh, I'm going to read it. It's on page 151 and it says, there is no crisis that can't be solved with a martini and a cigar. And I wanted to know how much of that uh, works in your way of dealing with crisis, I think that's my my own line. My own. <laughs> I kind line. of felt as though it might be. It is my own line that I that I live by myself. Uh -huh. But I'd have to say that it was something that I, I I probably learned from this fellow, my mentor, who I traveled with so much because of his lackadaisical attitude toward crisis. Right. Remember, this was a man who ran CIA's worldwide operations mm -hmm. and every day gets to an office in turmoil because of everything that's happening all over the world and everybody wanting his attention because they think whatever they're doing is the most important thing going. And uh, But you always had a sense with him that he handled it in stride mm. and it was because he just knew how to temper everything around him. And I imagined that as a martini and a cigar. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and again, for those of you that uh, will read the book, the gentleman in the back seat of the car, uh, again, who's a little more worldly than our, than our driver, is very much that type of man who, you know, is always looking for the fine wines, the fine hotels, and, um, and he partakes a lot of, or, or he shares a lot of 
um, his way of living through life with the driver. I mean, this book takes place uh, over six days. Uh, they go about 3,000 miles in those six days. So it's a lot of time, the two of them in the car. And, uh, and you can see a little bit of the sharing of uh, mindsets and information that at the end of the day sort of serves both of them, I think. It was a give and take. I mm -hmm. mean, it, um, when I first read it, when I first wrote it, I thought it was a little one-sided where the, uh, the driver was coming away with the life's lessons. But then I realized that it, it, it definitely works both ways. And there were lessons for his passenger to learn from his devil-may-care attitude right. and the way he, he, he goes about life. Did you learn a little bit of that from your friend that joined you on the road trip? Absolutely. Hmm. Yes. In fact, I, he's, a, he's actually joining us tonight at Book Soup oh. when I sign books. So tonight we're having a book signing here in Los Angeles. And tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, it starts at 7 o'clock it's at book soup and I think it goes on for about an hour there I've never been there before so I'm quite excited to see book soup absolutely and I and you had you were gracious enough to invite me before we started this and unfortunately I'm committed for tonight otherwise I would have loved to be there well hopefully everybody else will go <laughs> Wouldn't that that's be right nice? so anyone that is in the Los Angeles area please do uh, go by book soup because um, this is definitely worth a read it's uh it, it was a lot of fun uh, the one thing I did um, I did notice in here was the fact that the driver was 39 years old he was turning 39 and what I wanted to ask you was um, my experience with you know friends and, and, and life that you know for people that age it's almost uh, a place where you do sort of take a step back you're just on that cusp of getting into your 40s and you say wow like let me look around let me see if I've really achieved everything I thought I would achieve at this point and the driver your protagonist had a little bit of that in him he was trying I think to ignore it with the laissez-fairness of his attitude but there does come a time in your life where you sit back and assess have I really achieved what I thought I was going to achieve have you achieved what you thought you were going to achieve I have I beyond my wildest dreams all the experiences I've had doing all the different kinds of work I have as a journalist mm -hmm. uh, working undercover for the FBI uh, oh, that's so cool. In, in, in intelligence, once I stopped being director of the Monaco Intelligence Service, there was no place else to go. So <laughs> was, there was no point in doing intelligence and espionage anymore, which is why I decided to uh, invent a new phase for myself, mm -hmm. which ultimately became uh, taking road trips and writing novellas about them. Sounds like fun to me. It's a lot of fun. I'm enjoying I, it. Absolutely. And I think that's what life is about is, um, you know, we, we have this preconceived notion that we have to pick something when we're 19 and stick with it the rest of our lives. And I don't think life works that way. And I don't think it should work that way. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. uh, that's every every new day is an opportunity to do something else. Right. Yes. Do you have children? Yes, I have two grown daughters. Okay. And, uh, and have they taken their own path in life? I'm sure they have. Uh, yeah, I think one's still working on it. The other okay. one's uh, they're, they're doing okay. <laughs> We're always still kind of working on it. Yep, yep. Yeah, and I've absolutely. got two. I've got two grandsons as well. Oh, congratulations! And uh, they're they're the greatest joy of all. Mm -hmm. And they're only four months apart. Oh so wow, that's fun. Growing up in the same same neighborhood as brothers, so uh, I, I I feel extremely blessed. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Well, this was um this really was a a, a fun read. If there's um if there's one, I don't want to call it a life lesson. Um, but this book really makes you sort of feel as though you're gaining some life lessons. If there's uh, a life lesson that you want to share with people that are maybe thinking of becoming novelists themselves, uh, any tips for writers? Oh, well, absolutely. I'd say, first of all, take a road trip um, <laughs> and set your mind free and op mm. open your spirit to the road, first and foremost. Uh, but the, the second is voice. Mm. It's, uh, it's key to uh, writing fiction is you've got to find the right voice, even if you are becoming another character in the telling of the story that you want to tell. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I, I, I incorporated into this particular novel, which I had not before, and, and I think quite successfully, is I took story structure very seriously, the kind of story structure that Robert McKee teaches to film students that derives um, from um, Joseph Campbell and ultimately from Greek mythology. Which entails doing what? Uh, that most stories all, whether you know it or not, when you go to movies, the ones that you are most going to be absorbed by have that re um, the call thread. at the beginning, the refusal of the call, um, the fun and games mm -hmm. in the middle. I, I, there, there is a, and, and we're not talking formula here or formulaic writing. We're just tra talking about having a structure that people through the ages mm. have appreciated, even if it's only on a subconscious level. Hmm. Well, it, it, it may have hit me subconsciously because I really did enjoy, enjoy reading this book. Um, if you had to look back and, uh, and talk to your 20-year-old self, what would you tell him? 
Martini and a cigar. <laughs> uh, lighten up. Don't mm -hmm. think. Don't take everything so seriously. Mm -hmm. I think that would be the best advice of all. Yes. And as you said, do what you want to do as each new day arrives. Mm -hmm. Change direction. Change direction, and I think keep yourself open to new experiences. Uh, the one thing I enjoyed about uh, about the book is the older character shared with a younger character, um, you know, the fact that when you are traveling to a new place, you know what, it's nice to try the local food, try something indigenous, understand where, where you're from. The, the surfer guy is to be expected, you know, I was always looking for the burger joint. Burger and fries. And, yeah. you know, you, know, you, you, you want to be eating something like, you know, real good buffalo if you have the opportunity to try that. Exactly. And so. that comes out, of course, in the, in the novel. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I think uh, that's the one thing I enjoy about traveling is just the opportunity to get out of your comfort zone. Which again, for some people, is hard, right? Uh, even for me, it's hard. Mm. You get people in general get so used to their their ritual and stuck into it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I'm probably happiest when I'm just doing my usual thing. Sure. I like writing, of course, and so I'm at my at my neighborhood Starbucks every morning where I like to write, yeah. and I'm sitting there. And if that gets disrupted by a road trip, I'm all already a little gnarly about the whole <laughs> thing. So I know I have to push myself right. to take these road trips. Um, just so I can have these new experiences that I can write about. One more quote here. Um, Mark Twain, explore, dream, discover. Great line. Absolutely yeah. great yeah. line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The father of American literature for good reason. Yes, yes. Uh, very, uh, very poignant writing. Uh, and again, I enjoyed that it, um, although it's, uh, it, it looks like a light book, it actually has a lot of depth to it. Yes, and what you're actually holding in Bound Galleys, the book itself is not paper, it is a hardcover. Oh, I love that even more. Yeah. I love hardcover books. I actually only try and buy hardcover books to the chagrin of um, my myself when I try and move physical homes, which I've been doing lately. <laughs> I'm carting around boxes of books and people think I'm crazy, but I love them. Yeah, me too. Yeah, the hardcovers. Absolutely. Perfect. Uh, we, um, we're going to close up here. Please let us know where we can find this book if we're interested in buying it. Uh, well, it's it's published by Skyhorse, okay. so it should be in bookstores who, who order it. Uh, sure. I know it's available in Santa Barbara because I just did some book signings there. Okay. Uh, Tecolote in Montecito and Chaucer's in Santa Barbara. And I'm assuming and, uh, on Amazon. Uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It is, I'm happy to say that um, I've only had five-star reviews so far wow. on this book. So Fantastic. I'm, I'm feeling really good. And this was just published, was it not? Just uh, October recently. October 4th. Right. So, wow. On Tuesday, it was published. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. I've never had aspirations to become a writer, although I do enjoy writing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I usually write for my own mental relief, if you will. It just sort sure. of takes me back. Well, and it's good me therapy down. aside from anything else. It does. Yes. In fact, I would recommend. You asked me earlier about advice. Sure. If you need a therapist, someone needs a therapist. Don't bother. For one hundred seventy-five dollars an hour, you might as well save your money and write, because all a therapist does is try to get you to pour out of yourself something from your soul. Mm -hmm. And when you write, you're accomplishing that. Write about yourself, whatever your problem is. It's writing as therapy, and it's just as effective as spending money on a therapist. Therapy is, uh, is something you're not going to need if you read this, and uh, you'll enjoy <laughs> and, reading and, it. And go to work writing yourself, and taking road trips. And taking road trips. That, I think, would be my number one takeaway. If you haven't taken a road trip, and you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a countrywide. Um, take a weekend. Just drive to that city that might be an hour and a half away that you've never sure. been to. Or that you haven't been to in ten years, you Just, know it's and don't it book anything. Bit. Stay free, right? Stay free, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Robert Erringer, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Katerina. Um, I wish you all the best with your book signing thank today, you. and you know, and and uh, now that you're on my radar, because as I was saying before, um, I'm a big reader. I will definitely look out for some of your other novels. I'll go ahead and and order them as well because I enjoy your writing style. You're so kind. Thank you very much for yes. that. Yes. Uh, for those of you at home, thank you for being with us today. This was Book Circle Online again. You can find us uh, daily via our website, bookcircleonline.com. Uh, you can also catch this interview and our other interviews uh, via our website, uh, our larger parent company, After Buzz TV, and also uh, via YouTube and iPod Podcast. I always get that confused with uh, iPad and iPod. There's so many IP things. Um, so salute to Steve Jobs as well on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, thank you for being with us. It was thank you so much, Katerina. From managing editor Jason Squamata, executive producers Maria Menounos, Phil Svitek, and Kevin Undergaro, we would like to thank you for tuning in to Book Circle Online. For more discussion, go to bookcircleonline.com. 
And if you have comments, questions, or book title suggestions, write us at info at bookcircleonline.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this is Book Circle Online. BCO, join the circle.